Good morning. Good morning. Boy, it's glad to see everybody here this morning. Uh, been a kind of stressful couple of weeks, hasn't it? Yeah. Some announcements. Uh, we at the Bottle Drop Place, we've been approved for a nonprofit uh, account. And so now we'll be using blue bags. Blue bags. These look a little bigger than the other ones. So, so blue bags. And there's some blue bags over here uh, in the foyer. So take, take, no, those are. Yes, an apron. It's my apron. So um, what, what will happen is then we're allowed to carry more of these at one time. And uh, then whenever we need to, uh, whenever we want to receive the funds, we just call them and tell them and they mail a check to us. So uh, make sure you pick up your blue bag and take it home with you. Make sure you pick up a blue bag and take it home and, and then bring your bottles in with, uh, with the blue bags. And, uh, you know, dur during this fire that, uh, that's been going on, we've uh, had uh, uh, paramedics and uh, some EMTs that have used our, drive, our parking lot and drive area as a staging place. And uh, they graciously sent us two great big bags of cans and bottles. And, for us to use for our recycling, and so uh, we'll do that, and that uh, certainly uh, is money that can be well spent on our missions ministry and uh, our benevolence. The other thing too is there's uh, we we printed up some more of these Bible study uh, uh, notebooks, and there's plenty of them over there now. I guess there's. Got about twelve or thirteen of, over there by where where Helen is right now. She's she's like this is like 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 that uh, QVC network, you know. <laughs> but wait, there's more. Uh, if you take one now, then we'll put some more out there. <laughs> so uh, these are really good for keeping notes and 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 even in your Bible study or keeping a journal or whatever. Uh, we we print those and put them together right here. We don't have to order these in. So, okay. And Any other announcements? And what? In the bathrooms, there are. Uh, you know, I, Barbara, I, I don't talk about in the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 yeah, that's it. <laughs> They'll find out when they go in. Just, actually, maybe I should because some, some may not know how to operate those things. Yeah, we have new soap dispensers in the, in the bathrooms. And it gives out the foam uh, soap like, like you get in commercial buildings and stuff. You just push it and get a little bit of foam there, and that's plenty. Just one time, okay? And, uh, and, then the, uh, and it doesn't leak. That's the big thing. It doesn't leak all over the place. And then uh, the paper towels are the touchless towels. You just put your hand in front of it and it comes out. You tear off a thing and, and uh, use one. Pre yeah, they're pre-measured, so use one or two at the most. Um, see, I, I, f I figured this out. With one, I get all the wet, wet, wet off, and then with the other, it really dries it good. So uh, two, sheets, two sheets per person. <laughs> In the long run, the cost will be less because the old towels, we were, uh, you know, a lot of them, you get a whole glump that comes out. And there was a lot of waste there, so. Uh, and the soap was leaking out, so there's a lot of waste there. So in the long run, it's, we're going to be good stewards of, of what the Lord has provided us with. We want to continue to remember the victims of the wildfires in our area, the loss of uh, homes and businesses, property, uh, animals, uh, just remember them and also 
remember the, the respond to firefighters and, and EMTs and paramedics that are still out on the line uh, trying to get this thing under control. I understand it's about 45% contained right now, the open chain fire is. 55 now. Praise God. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> what was that? No, this is not an auction. We're not bidding anything. So you, you don't have to go up from there. <laughs> I mean, I'd love to go up from there. But, uh, also, the victims of the floods in other parts of the world, too. And uh, the earthquakes that's been going on, the floods, the storms that we've been seeing, especially back east, uh, these hurricanes that uh, are coming. Yeah, I think it's uh, around uh, 19, 19th chapter of Revelation somewhere. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And somebody asked me that the other day. So, Pastor, where are we at in, in the Bible and all this stuff? <laughs> I'm glad you asked. <laughs> so, and, and the good thing is it was so, so exciting because I got an opportunity to actually witness and share the kingdom gospel with one of the paramedics that was down. So, uh. The Bible says that Jesus... Had inhabits the praises of his people. Literally, he sits down and loves the praises of his people that would inhabit things. He dwells. He, uh, he pitches his tent, if you will, uh, amongst his people, the praises of his people. And so as we come together this morning, let's lift our hearts up to the Lord and lift our voices up to the Lord. Uh, don't be afraid to shout it out. Even if you're even if you have this problem that I do of not having a, uh, well, somebody said your bucket had a hole in it. My whole bucket bottom is out. <laughs> so I may not sing in tune, but I'm going to sing as unto the Lord, and that's what we ought to do. Let's begin this morning by singing. Uh, they know we are Christians by our love. It's so good to see the love of everyone that through this crisis and everything, how people has reached out in love for one another especially a lot of the churches that have stepped up and, uh, and have been a great witness for the Lord. And that's how people know. In fact, they, uh, Jesus said that. They'll know that you're my disciples if you have, what, love for one another. And it's okay if you have the smoky throat, too. <laughs> I've got a lot of smoke in my system here. But... <clears throat>
soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. you have your hand upon each one of us, Lord, that you love you, love us each one so greatly, Lord. I thank you for your presence here with us this day, Lord. I just pray that the Spirit will fill each heart and soul, that the words that will be spoken in our, our message today, Lord, will sink deep, will penetrate to the very bottom of us, Lord, that we can serve you and use it for your glory in every way. I pray that you'll be with Pastor Rick as he gives us a message, let him be truly anointed by you, Lord, and let the words just project out that we may understand everything that's being told to us. I give this all to you in the most loving name of Jesus. Jesus. Amen. 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 This morning, as we continue our study of the longest chapter of the Bible, Psalm 119. We're going to be looking at verses 41 through 48. And this uh, is a prayer and a promise. A prayer and a promise. The sixth paragraph of this uh, chapter of the book of Psalm uh, is entitled Wah. Wah. It's the sixth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And in this paragraph, the psalmist uh, expresses a desire to experience God's covenant promises, <clears throat> his promises of his unfailing love and, and salvation. Remember before I said that uh, that in order to experience God's promises and God's uh, uh, salvation, and in order to experience God in our lives, we've got to have the want to. We've got to have that desire. And here we see the psalmist has that desire in his heart to truly experience. Uh, God's covenant promise, God's unfailing love, His mercies, if you will, and, and, and salvation. He wants, he wants the courage to answer His persecutors completely and with full confidence. Wouldn't you like to, to be able to do that? You want the courage to be able to stand up to those who oppose the Word of God and to be able to confidently and completely respond in a loving way, but to respond to them with full confidence 
under the power of the Holy Spirit working in your life. I think we all would like to do that. We all need that as, as people, uh, even as people ask us about our faith, we want to be able to boldly proclaim the kingdom gospel to them. And I think that uh, uh, in experiencing God's uh, covenant promises in his life, the psalmist uh, knows that it'll give him the ability to do six things to the glory of God. After all, whatever we do should be done to the glory of God, shouldn't it? When we come here together together, we don't come here for our own glory. We don't come here just because folks can see us going into the church and say, oh, what a nice person that is. No, we come here for God's glory because what has God told us? God has told us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves. God has commanded us to come together for corporate worship in order that he might be glorified. And so uh, experiencing uh, God's covenant promises in his life, it will give this psalmist the ability and, and it will also give us the ability to do six things to the glory of God. It's going to give him the ability to deal with his enemies with confidence. When someone challenges you in your faith, isn't it good to be able to just, just to stand bold and, and, and in confidence and to get to the Word of God and share with them? Yeah. It also give him the ability to be obedient to God. To be obedient to God. Thirdly, it'll give him the ability uh, to have the ability to live out his faith with courage and, and freedom from fear. He'll be able to, uh, uh, to witness to kings. And I, I don't just mean just to kings per se, but to anyone who is maybe a, in a higher position in life than he is, maybe someone who is more educated than he is. It'd give him that ability to, to, to be able to boldly witness to that individual. It's been great as I've traveled around to be able to witness to various different people, to, to be able to witness to college professors and, uh, and to be able to witness to those who are in a position in the government and everything. Even though they're in a higher status that I may be, it is, also, it is always good to know that, that the Word of God is powerful. And it's sharper than a two-edged sword. And it's, it's, it's our weapon to use against uh, the, the, the enemy. But it also it's good to know that we can stand in, in the power of the Holy Spirit with boldness to be able to witness to those. And that's what will give him the confidence to do also. It'll, it'll uh, allow him to be able to delight in God's Word. I think the more we know God's Word the more we delight in God's Word. The more we, we experience the truth of God's Word in our own lives, the more we delight in God's Word. And I think uh, the more we hunger and thirst for God's Word. You know, something that, that brings goodness into your life, you want more of that, don't you? I can't, I can't think of anyone that would say, man, that really makes me feel good. Don't give me any more of it. You know, it's, that makes me feel so good. I want more, I want more, I want more. And, and it'll allow him to be able to delight in God's word. And also, it'll allow him to be able to meditate on God's word. He'll spend more time in God's word, in meditation of God's word. You know, one of the signs of a godly man and woman or woman is that he or she will pray for God's grace and, and pray for God's uh, for strength, for God's grace and for strength to use God's grace in their lives not for selfish gain, but for the glory of God. For the glory of God. Listen, do you pray for equipping grace just so you will be able to answer uh, or minister in a way that you'll get praises from men? Or do you pray for God's empowering grace 
just so you're able to be bold in your witness and defense of the word of God so that you can show others how much better you are than they are? Or, or do you pray for God's grace in order to bring glory to God? The Bible says in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, Therefore, whether you eat or drink, and whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do. I would go so far as to say this. Whatever you do, wherever you are. Whether it's at job, at, uh, at work. Do your work to the glory of God, not to man. I don't want to, to just please my boss. I want to please God because if I'm pleasing God, my boss will be pleased because God has some higher standards. Amen? Amen. And, and, and uh, in your studies, if you're taking any classes or, uh, or uh, doing any studies, do it to the glory of God. I don't want to study, I don't want, I I don't study the Bible just to get knowledge, to be smart. I want to study the Bible so that I can glorify God through being able to share the Word of God. And, and, you know, I get uh, questions, sometimes far out questions from some folks uh, uh, about certain portions of of Scripture. And, and, And I'm looking at that, I'm saying, man, how do I answer that? Well, I got to go back and do some more studying and and, and more because I want to give the correct answer. I want to, I want to glorify God by, by leading them the right way. Maybe in your own family or out in the neighborhood. Whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. See, the psalmist has a, a deep desire to glorify God. So in this paragraph, we find two things. We find, number one, we find the psalmist's prayer to experience God's covenant promise. And then secondly, we find the psalmist's promise to live his life for God. Let's first look at at, uh, uh, a prayer. We're looking at a prayer and a promise this morning. So let's look at a prayer to experience God's covenant promise. Promise. We find that in uh, the uh, verses 41 and through 43. The psalmist writes, Let your mercies come also to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your word. So shall I have an answer for him who reproaches me, for I trust in your word. And take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for I have hoped in your word ordinances. So let's look at those verses, uh, each one of them individually. First of all, verse 41, let your mercies come also to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your word. Now in Genesis, in Genesis chapter 17, verse 7, God made a covenant uh, with Israel that he would be their God and they would be his people. He says, And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. At the very heart, at the very heart of this covenant relationship is God's mercies. God's unfailing love with Israel. Now that phrase mercies, it's the same as, as a God's unfailing love. It comes from the Hebrew word chesed, C-H-E-S-E-D, chesed. In, in the history of mankind, God's chesed, God's mercies, his unfailing love has triumphed and, and listen, folks, it will triumph completely over all of Satan's works. You know, I've read the Bible. 
And I snuck over to the end. <laughs> we win. Amen? Amen. God's unfailing love will triumph. It has and it will triumph over all of Satan's work. So, listen, we are called, listen now, we are called to never doubt God's mercies. Never doubt his unfailing love, but instead to always hope in that. Jesus Christ is our help today, our hope tomorrow. He is our hope for tomorrow. And we need to always hope in God's unfailing love. The Bible says in Psalm 130, verse 7, O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is mercy. There is chesed. There is mercy. And with him is abundant redemption. I love that. Abundant. It's not just mere redemption. It's abundant redemption. You know, God doesn't do things small. Everything God does, he does in a big way. Now, I, I know, listen, I, I know how easy it is to get stressed out, to get depressed, to get fearful about the COVID-19, about the, the flooding in parts of the world, the storms and earthquakes, or the wildfires right here in our own community. I know how easy it is for us to, to, to get fearful and distressed about that. I've talked to a lot of different people, and, I've, I've, you know, there's been thoughts on this both sides of the fence. People are, uh, I've, I've heard from people how fearful they are. But God, listen, God has called us to uh, walk by faith, not by sight. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Our, our lives should be directed by faith, not by fear. We're to hope in the Lord, for he has triumphed and will completely triumph over all of Satan's works. Or as Roseanne used to tell me, God's in control. Pastor, God's in control, and that is so true. And folks, listen, we need to let, to, to leave the control in God's hands. We need to leave that control. You know, oftentimes we pray for God's help, and we pray that God will just come in and just intervene and take over and, and resolve this, this problem that we're having in our lives, and we walk away, and then what happens? We try to resolve it ourselves. We give the control to God, but we don't leave it with God. We need to leave control with God. We need to, to, to trust Him because He will triumph over anything that comes our way. The psalmist in verse 41 calls upon God's covenant name, Yahweh. Anytime you see in the Old Testament, you see the word Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that it's capitalized, the whole thing. It's, it's referring to God's uh, covenant name, Yahweh. Yahweh. And, and, and the psalmist here, he, he calls upon Yahweh and, and prays that he will experience God's chesed. He will experience God's mercies and, and God's salvation according to the promise of his covenant. Pastor Ivan, in his commentary on Psalms 119, says this, quote, Calling upon Yahweh in this manner is normally done when a believer is in pitiful state that requires help from God. Then the believer reminds God of his covenant and asks him to fulfill his promise of salvation. The salvation that he desires here is a comprehensive deliverance from all the evil plans of an enemy towards him. Verse 41, the psalmist is praying for God's covenant grace, for his 
mercies and salvation. Verse 42 says, So shall I have an answer for him who reproaches me, for I trust in your word. Now from this verse we see the psalmist. The psalmist was a target, really, of... uh, of those who sought to destroy him. Several verses, uh, verse 23, uh, in verse 23 it says, Princes also sit and speak against me. And then in, in, over in verse 69, in verse 69 it says, uh, The proud have forged a lie against me. Verse 78, Let the proud be ashamed, for they treated me wrongfully, with falsehood. Verses 85 and 86, the proud have dug pits for me. In verse 86, it says, uh, all your commandments are faithful. They persecute me wrongfully. And then verse 95, verse 95, the wicked wait for me to destroy me. 110, the wicked have laid a snare for me. In verse 122, he says, be, be surety for your servant for good. Do not let the proud oppress me. In verse 134, redeem me from the oppression of men that I may keep your precepts. He was being oppressed. He was being reproached. He was being persecuted. And so he says, God, if I, if I can receive your uh, covenant promise, if I can receive your mercy, your unfailing love, and, 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 and your salvation, and that word salvation, not just the spiritual salvation, but his help. The word salvation his, means his help. If I can get your help in this, Lord, then I will have an answer for those who reproach me. How many times have we prayed to God for an answer to, to a question that comes before us, or we prayed for an answer of a situation that we find ourselves in. God help me. I, I need some direction in my life in this area. And, and the psalmist goes to God for that. Help me. He desperately needed assurance that God was present with him and that God would deliver him. And with that assurance, he was confident. Because look what he says in the last part of verse 40, up in verse 41, the last part. For I trust in your word. For I trust in your word. He was confident that he could face his enemies and answer them. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him. And he'll direct your paths. Then verse 43. And take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for I have hoped in your ordinance. That meaning, that phrase there, the word of truth, it's a short but complete answer that the psalmist hopes to make to his enemy that he speaks about in verse 42. You know, the Bible says you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. We need to know the truth of the Word of God. And listen, this is so important. Listen, we must know the the Word of truth, God's Word, and use it to counter the attacks of our enemies. What did Jesus use in the wilderness when he was attacked by Satan with temptations one after another? Every time he was tempted by Satan, he would always come back, for it is written, and he would quote scripture. That's why it's so important for us to be in the word of God, to get that, to to meditate on God's word, to, to memorize God's word, to put it in our hearts. That we can have an answer. That we can can, uh, stand against the attacks of the enemy. So in verses 41 through 43, we have the prayer. The prayer of the psalmist to experience God's covenant promise of his unfailing love, his mercies, 
and his salvation. And then we go to the second part, a, prom a promise to live for God's glory. Verses 44 through 48. So shall I keep your law continually forever and ever. And I will walk at liberty, for I seek your precepts. I will speak of your testimonies also before kings, and I will not be ashamed. For I will delight myself in your commandments, which I love. My hands also I will lift up to your commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. In these five verses, the psalmist states that if the Lord answered his prayers in, from verses 41 through 43, he would be enabled to live for the glory of God in the manner that he lists in the next few verses. Verse 44, he says, So shall I keep your law continually forever and ever. He says that he will live for the rest of his life in obedience to God's laws. See, obedience to, to uh, God's law and God's word, really, is mentioned often in this particular psalm. Notice in verses 4 and, uh, four and 5, you have commanded us to keep your precepts diligently. Oh, that my eyes were directed to keep your statutes. In verse 8, I will keep your statutes. Oh, do not forsake me utterly. Verse 17, deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and keep your word. That I may live in, in obedience to your word. Verse 34, give me understanding and I shall keep your law. I shall be obedient to your, to your word. 55 and, and uh, 56. I remember your name in the night, O Lord, and I keep your law. This has become mine because I keep your precepts. Verse 88. Remove me according to your loving kindness so that I may keep your, the testimony of your mouth. In verse 100 and 101. I understand more than the ancients because I keep your precepts. I have restrained my feet from every evil way that I may keep your word. Verse 129. Your testimonies are wonderful, therefore my soul keeps them. In verse 145, the psalmist writes, I cry out with my whole heart, Hear me, O Lord, I will keep your statutes. And then verse 167 and 168. My soul keeps your testimonies, and I love them exceedingly. I keep your precepts and your testimonies, for all my ways are before you, Lord. Do you see the pattern there? Obedience to the word of God. He walks in obedience to God's word. For, and, and, and he says this, why? For all my ways are before you. You can't walk outside of God's sight. God knows everything we do. God knows everywhere we go. God knows every word we speak. In fact, God knows every thought that goes into our minds. And because my ways are before the Lord, I walk in obedience to the Word of God. Obedience has always been uppermost in the mind of of the psalmist, as it should be uppermost in our minds as well. We are saved 
Listen, we are saved by God's grace. And we are called to live holy lives. Paul tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, that God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. Listen, God didn't save you because you were such a lovely person. He didn't save you because you were so good. You did all these wonderful things. God saved you by his grace because he loved you. God saves us Not according to our works, he says, but according to his purpose and grace, which has been given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. I want you to notice that, those, that phrase there, has been given. We didn't earn it. We don't work for it. It's been given. The gift of God is a free gift. And Peter, Peter writes in 1 Peter 15 and 16, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. That's why the Apostle Paul wrote, Let this mind be in you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul also wrote, as I imitate Christ Jesus, so imitate me. God says, I'm holy. Imitate that. Be holy. Our obedience, this is important for us to understand this. Listen very carefully. Our obedience to God is an indication of our love for God. And... It is a requirement for his presence in our lives. In John chapter 14, verses 23 and 24, Jesus made it very clear that if we love him, we'll keep his commandments. So our obedience is an indication of our love to him. And he went further and said, if, if we love him and keep his commandments... We will experience his presence in our lives and enjoy an abiding relationship with him and our Father. So it's a requirement for his presence in our life. Oh, let's never forget that. Never forget that. Our obedience to God is an indication of our love to him and is a requirement of his presence in our lives. In verse 45, the psalmist says, And I will walk at liberty, for I seek your precepts. Here the psalmist, the psalmist believes that he will be able to live with freedom, to practice his faith with boldness, without fear, because of his assurance of God's mercies and because of his commitment to obey God the principles of God's word. Especially, listen, since he says that he seeks them. That he studies them seriously with the intent to apply them to his life. When you read God's word, when you study the word of God, why do you do that? <clears throat> do you read it and study it because, well, that's what I'm expected to do. That's what I've been told to do. Uh, or I just want to gain as much knowledge as I can of, of, of what the Bible says, or do you read it with the intent to apply it to your life? Knowledge and understanding is so important, but we also need the wisdom to apply it to our lives. We need to read the Word of God. We need to meditate on the Word of God. And we need to apply what we read and study 
to our own personal lives. It's the reason I, I think I gave you that uh, kind of example to follow when you're studying and meditating how to place God's Word in your life. P-L-A-C-E. Is, is there a promise? P, is there a promise that we can claim? L, is there a, a lesson we can learn? Or is there a, uh, yeah, is there a lesson we can learn from this particular passage of Scripture? I'm trying to remember these now. Is there, I, I thought I had them written down again. Is there a life that, that we can follow? A, is there, a, is there a, an action? Is that right? Is there an action? Application. Application, action that we need to take. That's a good, another word for it. A, A, P, L, A, C, C. Is there a, what did I have written down for the C? Is there a confession I need to make? Is there a command I need to follow? So you, you could use those words in there interchangeably. Is there a confession I need to make based on what I read? Is there a command that I need to follow? E, is there an example that I need to follow? Or, listen, is there an example I need to avoid? Because sometimes when we read the Word of God, we read about, oh, he was a naughty guy. I certainly don't want to follow his example. I want to avoid that. And it's so important for us to, to not only read the Word of God, meditate on the Word of God, but to apply it to our own lives. To apply it to our lives. Verse 46. I will speak of your testimonies also before kings, and I will not be ashamed. The freedom to practice his faith with boldness will lead him to freedom from fear in talking about God's word even before kings. And, and he said he will not be ashamed of God's word. The Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Listen, it doesn't matter, folks. Listen, it does not matter if that person you're talking to about God's word is in a higher position in life than you are. It doesn't matter if they're more educated than you are. That doesn't matter. What really matters is if you will be obedient to God's word and boldly share the kingdom gospel without fear, without shame. Tom Myers is an evangelist, a good friend of mine. That, uh, in fact, he went to India with me one year and... Uh, he came to our church that I was pastoring in Everett, Washington one time and, and spent several, came I think one once a week and spent several weeks uh, teaching about evangelism, how to share your faith and evangelism. Listen to what he says, and you've, some of you probably heard me say this before, but, but uh, it, it bears repeating. He says this, because a lot of us, listen, sometimes I get people that... that uh, they, they come to me, they, they come to me with guilt that they failed God. Because I talked about the Lord, I, I gave them the plan of salvation, the ABCs of, the, of, of, of salvation, and, and, and I gave them the Romans road or whatever, plan of salvation, and I gave it very clearly to them and everything, but they rejected, and I, fail, I, I feel I failed God. Let me tell you something. Successful evangelism. And this is what Tom Myers taught us, and I've never forgotten it. He says this. Successful evangelism is simply presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ 
in the power of the Holy Spirit and leaving the results to God. And leaving the results to God. Successful evangelism is simply presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ, that is the kingdom gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit and leaving the results to God. And why that is, is because number one, Jesus has already done his part on the cross. He gave his life for you and for me. The Holy Spirit does his part in convicting that person and drawing them to God. God will do his part when that person prays to accept Christ as their Savior. God will do his part by bringing them into the family of God, adopting them as his child and forgiving them of their sins. What's left is for us to do our part. And our part is merely presenting the kingdom gospel. Period. We don't do the convicting. Although I've seen many people try. I used to try to do that when I first became a Christian. The only thing I knew how to, how to, uh, how to present the gospel was I had this big old family Bible. The thing must have weighed a ton. I weighed about 10 pounds or something. I'd carry that with me. Boy, I'd threaten to thump them on the head if they didn't accept Christ, you know? Yeah, Bible thumpers. Or, or, or I had this thing about, you know, turn or burn. <laughs> that's it. Well, that's not the kingdom gospel presentation. We just need to simply present the kingdom gospel. Without Jesus Christ, you're lost. You're a sinner. You're lost without Christ. God loves you. He wants you to be his child. And he'll forgive you of your sins if you'll ask him for forgiveness of your sins. Let the Holy Spirit do his work. It's not up to me to convict that person. And the other thing is, I don't have God's part. It's not up to me to say, oh, bless you, now you, I will allow you to enter the kingdom of God. No, no, that's God's part. My part is simply presenting the gospel. That's what your part is. Verses 47 and 48, the last two verses, says, And I will delight myself in your commandments, which I love. My hands also I will lift up to your commandments, which I love. And I will meditate on your statutes. In these two verses, the psalmist displays the personal pleasures and satisfaction in his heart because of God's mercies and salvation that he had prayed for back in verse 41. When he said, let your mercies come also to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your word. And that will lead him to delight in God's commandments out of love for God's Word. Delighting in God's Word. That's the recurring theme of this psalm. That's, that's why we, this series we've, we've entitled Delighting in God's Word. Because it's a recurring theme throughout Psalms 119. Is delighting in the Word of God. The psalmist further says this, that he will lift up his hands to God's commandments. There was a 19th century theologian whose name was Frank Delitz. I guess. I don't know how to pronounce it. Delitz. 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 I don't want to slaughter his name, so I'll just say Franz D. And he says that lifting up of hands in verse 48 is an expression of fervent longing desire. In fact, David said in the book of Psalm in 28, verse 2, he says, Hear the voice of my supplication when I cry to you, when I lift up my hands toward your holy sanctuary. 
The Bible says in uh, uh, Psalm 134, verse 2, Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. And David also wrote in Psalm 141, verse 2, Let my prayer be set before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Man, when, when I lift up my hands, it's, it's God, I'm, I'm here, I'm receptive to your blessings. But I also want to praise you and honor you and glorify you. The lifting up, it's, an, it's a longing desire. A longing desire to glorify God. A longing desire for His mercies and salvation, His unfailing love, His covenant promise to be in my life. The psalmist ends this paragraph by saying, I will meditate on your statutes. He goes back to the foundation of knowing God's Word, which involves reading the Word of God, meditating on the Word of God in order to have an effect, listen, on our character and our conduct. When we read and study God's Word, when we meditate on God's Word, when we do that honestly and sincerely, seeking God's word to be in our lives, it is going to change our character and our, con our conduct. What a great passage of scripture this paragraph is. I see here that it gives us two things. Number one, it gives us encouragement. And number two, it gives us a challenge. It gives us encouragement in knowing that God has an everlasting covenant to be our God and we his people. Listen, because of God's grace, we have been saved through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and have become children of the living God. We have become joint Heirs with Christ in all that the Father has. He is our God. We are his people. And, and as the Bible teaches us, folks, listen, God's mercies are new every morning. Oh, when I pray in the morning, I pray, thank you, God, for your mercies. Thank you, God, for life. Thank you, God, for every breath I take. It is a gift of life from God. Do you know that? Every breath you take is a gift of God for life. I thank you, God, for my health. A lot of times we take that for granted. Thank God for my health. I thank you, God, for, my, uh, for, for shelter that you provide for me. For my needs that I have. I thank you, God, for my family. I thank you, God, for my church family. What an encouragement it is to know that God is our God. We are his people. And he has an everlasting covenant to be just that in our lives. God loves us with an everlasting love. He is from the beginning to the end. He is before and after. He is the Alpha, the Omega. He is our salvation. And, and over in Psalm 121, verse 2, it says, the Lord says, my of the psalmist writes this in, in Psalm 121, verse 2. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. What an encouragement that is in these troubling times that we live in today. My help comes from the Lord. In Romans 
chapter 8, verse 35 through 39. And, and, and I want us all to understand this. All these wildfires, all the flooding, all the, the turmoil that's going around the world and everything. I want you to know something. Nothing, absolutely nothing will ever separate us from the love of Christ, from the love of God. Nothing. I had someone one time, she was a deaconess in the Catholic Church, I can say that, and she came up to me and she says, we're all children of God, we're all going to heaven, because the Bible says nothing shall separate us from God. And I says, oh, yeah? Uh, where was that at? Let's go look at that again. What does it say? Nothing shall separate us from the love of God. For God so loved the world. It's an everlasting love. And, and, and we can rely on that promise of his during these troubled times that we're living in. Look at what he says. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, shall, shall distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, or floods, or wildfire, uh, wildfires, not wildflowers, wildfires, or hurricanes. As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded, he says, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor heights, nor depth, nor any other created thing. In other words, absolutely nothing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God showed his love to us through Jesus Christ. Because he sent his only son to the cross. To die for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him should not perish. But have everlasting life. I get excited when I read this particular passage of scripture. These, these eight verses. Because it is an encouragement it is an encouragement to me. And, and it also, listen, it also gives us a challenge. A challenge to trust in the Word of God. A challenge to meditate on His Word. A challenge to live in obedience to God's Word. And a challenge to seek His empowering grace that we might be able to boldly share his kingdom gospel to those who need it in this dark, troubled world. Oh, may our commitment be as that of the psalmist when he says this, I will speak of your testimonies and not be ashamed. I will delight myself in your commandments, which I love. More, I believe, than in any other time in history. More than any time in our whole lives. We need to be out presenting the kingdom gospel message to this world today. Because it is in chaos. It is a troubled world. And there's darkness all around. And we have that message of hope to give to the world. Jesus Christ is our help for today. He is our hope for tomorrow. So let's take that challenge and let us speak of God's testimonies. Let us speak of his kingdom gospel message and not be ashamed. And let us delight ourselves in God's word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, 
Oh, what a powerful, powerful scripture this is this morning. To give us encouragement, to give us a challenge. Let us be encouraged, Lord, knowing that you are our God. We are your people. And that you love us with an everlasting love. That your mercies are new every morning. Thank you. And Father, let us take this challenge. Let us take this challenge not to, not to be timid or shy. But Lord, let us take the challenge to boldly proclaim the kingdom gospel message. Not be ashamed. For there are many, Father, who are dying without Christ today. And how they need the message. The gospel message. The kingdom gospel message, Lord. Father, I ask your blessings on everyone that's here this morning. Thank you for their faithfulness in being in your, your house. coming to honor you and to just to bring glory to you, Lord. So let us do that from here. Let us, let us leave this place and go out into that mission field that is in front of us, that mission field that is beyond these gates, Lord. And, and let us be true ambassadors of yours and bring glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you guys. We'll see you next Sunday morning as we continue delighting in the Word of God.